so. Okay, so we got our test on Thursday. Any questions on that? Um, I know that like last time for the test, we kind of just like went through each chapter and you kind of just like highlighted like the main topics. I thought that that helped a lot if we could just do that again. Sure, sure. So let's see. We're starting with the virus chapter, I think. Right, that was chapter six. So I've got to pull up Blackboard. Okay, you guys see the chapter six? Okay, great. <clears throat> so, what I started this uh, PowerPoint off with, which is in all of our minds the last year or more, is of course. COVID and thought it would be kind of interesting to just kind of lead off chapter six with a diagram of the virus. This isn't what it actually looks like. You know, it's just a model, if you will, or, or a diagram, I guess, a computer generated diagram probably that shows some of those spikes on the surface of the virus, which you know docks with certain receptor sites on the host cells. And that's how the virus, of course, gets in. In, a, in that docking process, right? So I just thought that was kind of a cool intro, lead in, if you will. We also talked back in one of the earlier chapters about Pasteur and you know his role in um, putting to bed the a the, uh, a uh, biogenesis theory, right? But he was also instrumental in sort of coming up with the idea that rabies might have been caused by something different than bacteria. Little did he know it was a virus, but we know today, of course, it was. And so we go through a little bit of the history of, of virology, the fact that it came into its own, if you will, as a branch of biology in the 50s and continues to be a very important branch as evidenced by our current you know, pandemic. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot to say here. Obligate intracellular, you know what that means, I think, right? Obligate referring to what? It has to, it, it needs the host cell in order to replicate. Yeah, and intracellular meaning it does its dirty work inside the cell, right? Yeah. We also kind of focused a little bit again on units of length, just to give you a better sense really of how small these entities are. And there's an upcoming uh, figure on this, I guess, but this is just kind of referring some, to some of the basic properties, which I think are certainly worth uh, previewing. They do, this is just a really nice summary table that hits so many interesting aspects of what viruses are and how they work, right? And we could spend an entire and did spend an entire chapter, you know, focusing on these 10 or so bullets. Um, and then this was the slide I was referring to a moment ago, 
just to give you a sense of how tiny these things are, right? Viruses are, are uh, tiny. A big E. coli uh, looks like a woolly mammoth compared to this little human there, right? In terms of size, they're just the dwarfs. Bacteria dwarf most viruses in terms of size. Not all, but, but many. Um, and so all of these, of course, from number one all the way through to uh, number 10 are depicting different kinds of viruses. You can see again, their relative size compared to say bacteria. Oh, and then we talked a little bit about the fact that viruses have an outer protein covering, right? A, cap, a, a series of, of uh, capsomers, they're called, that make up a capsid, protein capsid. And then inside that capsid would be the nucleic acid, either a DNA or an RNA molecule. Um, any idea what we mean here by enzymes? What, would, what, what role would they play in viruses for viruses? I mean, why, why would a why would a virus carry not all but some carry a particular group of enzymes? Synthesize DNA or RNA. What is that? Uh, can you specify what enzyme in particular I think you're thinking of? Maybe, maybe I'm. So you're not thinking of the same thing. Poly, either. polymerase and, and reverse. Well, the polymerase enzymes, for the most part, this, I won't say that, that viruses never carry them, but I think for the most part, a lot of the times the cells provide the polymerase enzymes. I'm thinking of one particular enzyme that some viruses use to make DNA from RNA. What enzyme am I talking about? Is it the reverse transcriptase thingy? Oh, good job. Yeah, reverse transcriptase. That's exactly right. And um, the retroviruses, they're called, carry that particular enzyme because the cell isn't going to be able to provide that, that process of taking messenger RNA and making DNA from that. That's a special characteristic or quality to the retroviruses, of which, of course, AIDS is, is probably the best known example. There are others, of course, but that's the one that, that you might want to be familiar with. Um, and somewhere in this chapter, I also make mention of the fact that some viruses, I believe, even will transport their own transfer RNA molecules to shuttle amino acids. Um, so. The point I'm trying to make, I guess, is that for the most part, viruses rely on their host cell um, partners, quote unquote, not in a positive kind of partner way, but they rely on their host cells to provide all of the cell machinery to ultimately make more virus. But some um, may carry some of that cargo with them, if you will. So that's what these matrix proteins and enzymes are kind of getting at. And so then we go into some more details about the outer capsids, um, the fact that when we combine the nucleic acid and the outer uh, capsid, we call it that nucleocapsid, um, that some viruses may have external to the nucleocapsid an envelope, which is acquired from the whole cell membrane when the nucleocapsid buds from the cell. But there are some, of course, that lack an envelope, and we would call those naked viruses. And then we get into the helical and icosahedral types, which can be enveloped or naked. Um, I just find these icosahedral shapes just kind of bizarre, and they're kind of actually kind of pretty and unique, and geometric. Um, almost something out of a, a computer simulation or something, but these are, these are the actual shapes that, that some of these um, viruses take on. Very interesting. 
And then as we alluded to a moment ago in the introductory um, slide, that many of the envelope viruses have these glycoprotein spikes, which give them unique shapes and unique characteristics and functions in terms of being able to dock with certain cells if they have the proper receptor sites. And um, so some viruses are often given um, uh, abbreviated hyphenated names or uh, numerical le lettered names like this H5N1 or H5N2. And, and it describes the particular type of spikes there on the surface. These are, are typically glycoproteins shown there in green and yellow. So they're common to, to um, envelopes, right? Um, and we talked about the functions of the envelope helping again to dock with the host cell. We also alluded to a couple of complex viruses, the pox viruses and the bacteriophages, I believe it was, right? Unique atypical viruses. Um, bacteriophages, can, do you have to worry about those? No. Why not? They, they target bacteria. Only affect bacteria. Right. They're only targeting bacterial cells. Now, does that mean that bacteriophages can't indirectly influence our health? We have helpful bacteria in like our guts and stuff, so probably they can. Could they hurt us? Could they cause us harm, bacteriophages? Now that's kind of a dumb question maybe to ask, or maybe I didn't ask it very well. Could, could bacteriophages influence our health in a negative sort of way, and if so, how? Indirectly, yes. Right, how? The bacteria in our biome affect everything and our chemical balances and all of those things from the nitrates that they, you know, release and all of those other things. So if, if a bacteriophage screws up our biome, then it'll directly affect our health. You've got, you know, staph epidermidis and all of these things that maybe are commensal organisms, but we don't quite understand their benefits and, and they're essential to our function. You're right. Bacteria are absolutely critical to our health and we don't have an appreciation for both of their beneficial, the role they play beneficially and also what disease causing characteristics they can have as well. Although we, we, we know about infections and, and that kind of thing. What I'm asking you to think about here is could a bacteriophage, did you hear that motorcycle? Yeah, I heard that. One of the hell's angels. <laughs> um, Bacteriophages can influence the genome of bacteria, can they not? And they enter the lysogenic cycle and then make the bacteria more like pathogenic to us. Um, well, I'm talking, the answer is yes, but, but I'm talking about bacteriophages specifically. How do they influence the genome of bacteria? Well, it's through a process called transduction. That's what I want you to think about. That's addressed later in this chapter. So if a bacterium, let's say, is ordinarily not so pathogenic, but acquires genes from a bacteriophage that makes it more pathogenic, then that's something that should be of concern to us, right? Now, this is separate from conjugation, this is separate from transformation. I'm specifically addressing transduction, which we'll, we can talk more about in a few minutes. But um, even though bacteriophages don't directly impact us because they can't influence or affect our cells, they can indirectly because they, they can affect bacteria and bacteria can affect us. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so this is a nice summary of the various categories of viruses, both complex and enveloped and naked. And then we talk more about the genome and then we get into some examples of DNA and RNA viruses and we describe some of the enzymes that um, 
sometimes are carried. So, so you're right, even though I said a, month, a minute ago that sometimes the cells you know, provide those, it's not that uh, some viruses can't carry them. So I probably misspoke when I said that most polymerases are provided by cells. I think that might still be true, but some viruses can carry those. Um, and then we described that a moment ago as well. Gets into a little bit of the, histo uh, the taxonomy. Um, and then we get into viral multiplication cycles. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through all of these. Are there questions on the steps? Are we good with this? Yeah. Anybody else specific questions related to animal virus replication, how it occurs? This is something you're going to want to know. OK. <clears throat> so this just goes into a little in a little more detail. Um, and then there's some videos, of course, that you should have watched. And we talk about how viruses can influence host cells, uh, you know, microscopically. So this gets into that a little bit. The shape of the cell, the size of the cell, the fact that these inclusion bodies can sometimes form as a result of damaged cell organelles. Um, the notion that cells can sometimes fuse together to form these so-called quote unquote giant cells. All indications to a cytotechnologist, let's say that's examining tissue sample of a patient, if, if he or she were to see this, um, might suspect a potential viral infection if, they, if he or she sees these, these cytopathic impacts to patient's cells. So they can have major ramifications, can't they? Um, then we talk about some different potential cytopathic impacts that different kind of viruses have on cells. And this is not something you need to memorize. I think I said that when we did this chapter. But it's still kind of worth looking at to get a sense of how cells are impacted by different kinds of viruses. And we talked about how some viruses can lie dormant or latent for a while, only to be triggered into affecting the cell. Um, the fact that some cancers form as a result of viral uh, infection and ultimate transformation. And we talk about those, give you some examples of those. And then we get into specifically the bacteriophages and how they work on bacterial cells. And these steps are not necessarily a whole lot different from the preceding series of steps that we talked about or I showed you a moment ago they're related to enveloped animal viruses, but there are some differences. The fact that we can have both the lytic and lysogenic cycles um, is kind of unique. Um, are there any questions on those two components? Because I think you should know lytic and lysogenic. know what a prophage is. How would you define prophage? Structurally a lunar lander. Well, that's a joke, but. Well, that's a bacteriophage. Oh, whoops. Yeah. So don't confuse. Even though the suffix is the same, phage, pro, prophage, is shown here in blue. Right here, right? So in essence, a prophage is a chunk of viral DNA that has been incorporated into the genome, or in this case, the chromosome, right? Same, same thing, kind of. Um, well, yes and no. Um, it's incorporated into the chromosome of this bacterial cell. That's the prophage. And this prophage can sit inserted as part of that chromosome as this cell goes to divide. 
right, via binary fission, and you make two daughter cells. And those two daughter cells are genetically identical, are they not? Sure. And so are they both carrying the prophage? The answer, of course, is yes. Now, what kind of information might that prophage have in it? The instructions to make the virus. Right. It tells the host cell, if it enters into the lytic cycle, how to make more capsomers, how to make more viral DNA, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this lysogenic conversion that's described here um, is when that cell goes from the lysogenic cycle into the lytic cycle. Um, and, then, and then the other thing too that kind of goes hand in hand with this lysogenic conversion is the fact that the cell itself not only does it have the instruction booklet in the form of the prophage to make more virus, but it could also make that cell more pathogenic. So this, this sort of does marry the transduction concept with, with prophage concept. Because um, that, that pathogenicity that was transferred to the cell by the virus could have theoretically come from another bacterium via the virus vector. Again, this goes back to transduction, which is described at the end of the chapter. OK. Um, I hope you watch this YouTube video that talks about how bacteriophages could actually be beneficial to us you haven't watched that, you should definitely watch that. Uh, and then I think we talk about, um, oh, I'm sorry, when I was talking about transduction and, and so forth, that's in another chapter, isn't it? That was the microbial genetics chapter. I was thinking it was in the viral chapter, but it's in the next chapter. Sorry about that, or two chapters from now. Um, the end of this chapter gets into um, how we grow viruses, and the, the more common approach, I think, today versus 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago is to utilize more modern cell tissue culturing techniques, which get very complex. And I, I don't even understand all of the intricacies of how they do that. But they're able to do this much more efficiently, much cheaper than trying to inoculate 8 billion turkey eggs. They still do the turkey, chicken, egg, duck, egg thing. Um, but um, that's very time consuming, laborious. You got to have a place to store the eggs. Here you can just store Petri plates. You know, it's, it's just much more effective from a efficiency point of view. Um, So we talk a little bit about growing viruses. We talk a little bit about this technology, which is actually addressed in uh, chapter, it's a chapter 10 on biotechnology. I forget if that's the chapter. Bioengineering, genetic engineering, yeah. So being able to manipulate the genome of um, viruses has been a, a godsend for immunologists. And actually, we can we can use viruses that have had in certain de desirable genes incorporated into them, let them infect a cell and, and provide a beneficial gene to the cell that we've introduced into the virus. Um, and then we, I think, wrap up talking about detection and impacts of different kinds of viral infections. Talk about prions. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of slides here on prions both uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. We talk about scrapey disease a little bit in sheep and goat, well, mostly sheep. And then the, um, the most scary of the three here is the kutzfeld jakob disease, which involves prion infection um, or prion development. It doesn't always have to be an infection. It can be a genetically inherited variant too, whereby just like in the cow, you develop these big gaps 
in brain tissue of the human. And there was a little video here that talked about a husband who had lost his wife to a, to a, um, a form of, of uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease that apparently was something she inherited from her parents. But you can also get this um, through ingestion of prions. If you, eat, if you were to have eaten contaminated meat that had prion in it, this is not so likely now, but not that many years ago, there were a bunch of people in the United Kingdom that died by eating contaminated beef that had the prion in, in it. And um, do you know how the prion got into the ground beef that was sold at the supermarket? They were feeding the cattle meal that had ground up beef in it. So it was basically cannibalism. Ground up what in it specifically? It was other brain tissue from other cows. Right. Nervous tissue. But you didn't know that, that they feed cows cows. <laughs> I mean, most of the cows that are, are raised are fed, you know, grain and things we associate with feeding cows, grass, corn, silage. But commercial enterprises do use fillers, if you will, and some of those fillers um, came from last week's butchering. Nothing is wasted anymore, right? Well, anyway, it just turned out to be a pretty nasty, you know, way of transmitting the uh, the prion. So, viroids, I think, was the very end. This impacts uh, plants, which is this small little piece of in infectious RNA of all things. So, we just made very brief mention of of these other agents called viroids. And that was the end of chapter seven or six. Any any questions on six? Um okay, I gotta pull up seven here. Um, so here we just get into different aspects of growth, ecology. We talk a little bit about nutrition of microbes. We describe the major elements found in most all living cells, including bacteria. So this listing of six elements is the same for you and me as it is for the E. coli in our gut, Chopson. At least that's what I call it. That's the acronym that I come up with to help me remember it. Um, and then we get into ways in which cells acquire their energy, either through utilization of sunshine, right? These phototrophs, we call them, or they can get their energy from chemicals, like those that live, say, in Yellowstone National Park or down in those deep ocean vent communities, right? Getting their, they ultimately getting their energy from the earth, those, those, uh, those bacteria, those um, archaea that live in those um, smokers. So photo, of course, refers to light. So those are the two primary sources of energy that most bacteria are going to tap into. And then we got into how do cells get their carbon source? Well, some get them through assimilation of other organic compounds, right? Most bacteria are heterotrophic. There are some that are autotrophic. They get their CO2 from the atmosphere, just like a plant does. Why does a cell need CO2? Why does it need carbon? Well, if you're a cell and you want to make carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, you better have carbon because carbon's in all of those. Right? It's a pretty darn important element. And so we kind of get into a little more detail as to what types of autotrophs we've, we've got. And I mentioned light photo, talked about chemo, 
auto, those living in those hydrothermal vent communities, they generate their own um, organic compounds, but they get the energy from, in that case, the earth. But as I said earlier, most bacteria are heterotrophic. They have to assimilate, acquire, ingest, absorb, whatever term you want to use, food that is rich in these elements. Um, and then we give you some examples, and then we kind of asked you to kind of review these different types of movement of materials across membranes. So we didn't really talk a whole lot about that, but this is all stuff you should know from earlier classes. Passive transport, active transport. Any questions on any of these? Are we good with those? So, the bac sodium. so bacteria make use of all of these processes too. And then we get into a little bit of ecology. We talk about different factors that influence bacteria, remembering that the vast majority of these criteria you see listed here are directly influencing enzymes. So if you, if you denature an enzyme, it no longer can function. And if it's an important reaction that the cell needs to undergo and it can't do it, it might die, right? So we go through, again, all of those temperature. We define some things in temperature. We talk about oxygen. We talk about some different terms that describe different oxygen requirements um, or the ability to survive without having oxygen, right? Anaerobes, for example, uh, if they're strict, anaerobes would die in the presence of oxygen. They have evolved the means to survive without any oxygen present. Um, and then we often talk about many bacteria being facultative anaerobes, which is the best of both worlds, right? You can utilize oxygen aerobically, but you can also survive in its absence. So facultative meaning you are flexible in your, in your metabolism in terms of surviving in the presence or absence of oxygen. And we spent a lab coming up toward the end of the semester where we try to grow bacteria in a device called a gas pack. I think that was described in one of the earlier chapters. Uh, in fact, I know it was back in chapter three. Um, but most of the bacteria we work with in our labs are either aerobes or facultative anaerobes. Uh, and then we talked about culturing anaerobes using this thioglycolate medium. We used to use it in lab. It, Deb, our lab tech, used to make it up, but it just never worked like it should have worked. So we have since kind of not used it. But the premise, you know, is really kind of cool. You know, the fact that it's made up in such a way the medium is that we have more aerobic conditions toward this top here where the air uh, liquid interface would be. And as we proceed down into the medium, it becomes more and more and more and more anaerobic. So you have, you have all different possible, you know, uh, conditions available. So if you're a strict aerobe, you live at the very, very top. If you're a strict anaerobe, you're living, in this case, toward the bottom part of the tube. And if you can live both places, then you're facultative. So it's kind of a neat medium. Um, oh, there's the gas pack too, yeah. Ours isn't quite this sophisticated. Oh, and then we talk about again pH. We describe Mono Lake there in California and how some bacteria like it very acidic, others of, of them like it very alkaline. In our bodies, most of our bacteria are neutrophils. Right? Although there are bacteria that live in our stomach, love it, acidic. 
Um, and then we talk a little bit about halophilic, salt loving. Okay. Halo refers to salt, philic to love. Um, we didn't say a whole lot about osmotic pressure, but we did mention it, I think. Um, the fact that some bacteria can live in very, very deep parts of the ocean where the pressure is so, so high. Um, it's amazing. Yeah, I can't even hardly explain or describe the crushing pressure at that sort of depth going down 36,000 feet. Um, you know these submersibles that they were using when they first discovered these hydrothermal vent communities, these two or three man submersibles? Well, if, if for some reason there was any sort of um, crack in say the glass window pane of that device, of that submersible, any sort of barrier in the outer structure of that submersible would cause that entire submersible to be condensed and compacted down into something as small as my mug. That's how, how high the pressure is. Now, I, it's hard to kind of fathom that. <laughs> Can you imagine taking a big submarine or a three-man submarine and compressing it down into a you know, something the size of a microwave oven, let's say? I mean, that's how high the pressure is. Yet bacteria have evolved some to survive in that kind of an environment. It's astounding. Um, and then we get into some discussion of some different kinds of symbiotic relationships. Give you some examples of those. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Talk about leafcutter ants. We talk about how they grow fungi in pure culture. That's what they eat, right? In those subterranean nests underground. Pretty neat. Um, biofilms, fascinating ecology, fascinating stuff. Um, those of you in healthcare uh, careers should be very much interested in biofilms. Um, there's some excellent videos here that I hope you watch that talk about the role that biofilms play in, in disease and infection. It's, it's something that I think we just, and I'm guilty about it, I don't teach it as much as we should. I don't know if you nursing folks ever hear about biofilms in your nursing classes. Do you ever hear about? Yes? Okay, good. Because it's pretty interesting and important. You know, 80% of all infections in humans are related to biofilms. That's huge. I was just going to say, we talked about that at clinical the other day, um, how they're not like putting in catheters as much. Like if they, if they used to be like whoever came in for inpatient care, they put them in a, like a catheter in, and then they realized when those catheters are in, the biofilm is growing on them and all of them are, like it's very prone to infection for however long you have it in. So now a lot less people have them. So, and in, in the number of infections is going down. Uh-huh, yeah, that's great. It was probably at some point in time so common that nobody ever thought of it. You just, you did it. You just, and in went the catheter. It was the way we've always done it. And uh, it's hard to change things sometimes in medicine, as we know. But uh, sometimes there's good reason to, to try different things. Um, you should be familiar with how biofilms work. And again, I talk a little bit about that here, this concept of quorum sensing, right? Extremely important concept. Spend some time studying this. There's also some videos that I put on here. You know, we should watch this. It would be a interesting stuff. And again, these, these, um, these first two, especially, you should watch. It's only, you know, 24 minutes of your day. Um, this first TED Talk is getting to be, oh gosh, it's got to be probably close to six to eight years old now. Um, I kind of wish she would update her, her TED Talk, but it's really, really cool, interesting stuff. And then we talk about growth, and we talk about the curve, and we talk about binary fission. 
right? This is pretty easy. Don't worry about the math here for this. Um, those of you who have lab or are in lab, we kind of talked a little bit more about the standard plate count and as it as it relates to turbidity and being able to um, determine population size in a given test tube, if you will, or container, just by looking at the turbidity in concert with data that you would have developed by doing the standard plate count. Um, and then here's the growth curve I was referring to, the different you know, sections, components, lag, exponential, stationary, and death phases. I think this is pretty self-explanatory as well. Um, in fact, the fact that we tend to try to target bacterial growth in this uphill exponential growth phase, that's the that's the time to try to kill them or knock them out right there. Get them, get them when they're dividing, when they're most susceptible. That's generally what we do, try to do. Doesn't always happen that way. The chemostat, again, this is a system that allows you to kind of keep growing bacteria at a constant level um, by siphoning off the waste products and incorporating and adding the new nutrients at the same time. So we can make all sorts of things, vaccines, different kinds of industrial products, and so on. This introduces the spectrophotometer. Again, if you've had lab before, you should have worked with this. If you've had me in lab, we talked about this like two or three weeks ago. We also, I showed you in lab the other day, the, um, the hemocytometer, which is different from what they're describing here, but it has basically this etched grid on this microscope slide and you add a diluted sample of, of, let's say, bacteria in this case, and you would count the number of, of cells that you'd find in a particular grid pattern multiplied by a dilution factor that would give you an estimate of the population number, basically. That's how that works. But we have more sophisticated, like these flow cytometers, where they're able to count the cells. They can differentiate gram positive from gram negative. They can differentiate live from dead cells. It's just amazing the technology that we have available to us today to, to get this information that would have taken a lot more work not that many years ago. And that was kind of chapter seven. Any questions on seven? All right, let's take a look at eight. Metabolism. Well, I can't possibly go through this entire chapter in a half hour. Um, are there specific aspects of this you would like to, to talk about? It's just, it's such a huge chapter and multi topics multiple topics in here. Any particular aspects here that's really causing you consternation? Can you we go over like um, for like the Krebs cycle and glycolysis, just what's made along the way and at the end, just so I have it all clarified. Sure, sure. Okay, so once we get past the enzyme section here, we start talking about um, the various stages of aerobic Jeez. respiration. So let's go right to glycolysis. So here we see the three steps that we associate with aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Now we need to be careful The major difference between aerobic and anaerobic cellular respiration, even though both employ all three of these pathways, is the fact that in aerobic respiration, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. In anaerobic respiration, it's some other compound. It's not oxygen, right? It's some non 
oxygen electron acceptor like nitrate or sulfate. But regardless of which of the two we talk about, glycolysis is glycolysis is glycolysis. In fact, fermentation also employs glycolysis, right? So this is, this is a, a, a pathway that we're going to talk about now that is common to every single cell. Anaerobe, aerobe, strict aerobe, strict anaerobe, fermenter, you name it, they all undergo glycolysis. So in glycolysis, and, and this is what I just talked about here. In glycolysis, I'm going to go right to the topic here. We start off with glucose. Does that mean that glucose is the only uh, molecule that cells generate energy from? The answer, of course, is no. Can, can, can bacteria generate energy from breaking down proteins or lipids? Yes. In fact, there's another slide later in this chapter that talks about how degradation of other organic compounds fits into these various pathways, glycolysis sometimes, sometimes citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, right? Do you know which slide I'm talking about? It's later in this chapter. So we're going to assume glucose is the primary fuel molecule that's being degraded. Because oftentimes cells can take proteins and lipids and chemically modify them, incorporate them at some point within these pathways, or even sometimes produce glucose from them. So we see glucose at the top of the diagram. Specifically, we see the six carbons within glucose we understand that it's not just C6. That's not the chemical formula of glucose, right? What's the chemical formula of glucose? Nobody knows the chemical formula of glucose. You should all know that. Can you hear me? Isn't it like C6H12O6? It is. That's the chemical formula of glucose. And it takes on a ring shape. However, to make it more simplistic, we're looking at this linear form, if you will, with the six carbons just laid out, one next to the other, connected by what kind of bonds? What am I pointing to? I don't know. Did you guys take intro to chemistry or allied health chemistry? Anybody take a lot of I'm sorry? Are they the covalent bonds? They are, they're covalent bonds, very good. So we go through nine different reactions in glycolysis as evidenced by, of course, the nine circles, yellow circles. We start with glucose. We end with two pyruvic acid molecules or pyruvate, each of which is three carbons. So have we lost any carbons along the way? I don't think so. Therefore, is there any CO2 produced in glycolysis? If I can account for all the carbons, the answer is no, right? There's there's three times two is six, and that's what we started with. So no CO2 spun off here. But we do spin some things off, don't we? In addition to making the pyruvic acid, what else is made during glycolysis? I don't care about all the names of these intermediary molecules. That's not important. What's important to understand is what is made along the way, right? This is what I've been kind of stressing. We make some NADH, don't we? Two of those. We make some ATP. How many ATP are made in glycolysis? Be careful before you answer. Technically, how many ATP made in glycolysis? Four. Right, four. But two are broken down in step one and three. So if the question is how many ATP are are, are, are made, how many, how many 
ADP does the cell net a net gain of how many? You'd say two. Two. Yeah. And that's through something called substrate level phosphorylation, meaning that the ADP acquires its phosphate to become ATP from a substrate. And the substrate are these two diphosphoglyceric acid molecules. And then it happens again way down here toward the end of glycolysis. So the phosphate groups that are added to the ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, are coming from these precursor molecules. Okay. So to review, what do we start with? What do we end with? What do we make along the way? We start with glucose. We end with 2-pyruvic acid. We come away with two NADHs and a net gain of two ATPs. Everybody good with that? Then these pyruvic acid molecules are going to be used to incorporate into the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. And that's what's happening here. We're looking at one of the pyruvic acids, one of the two, but there's really two made per glucose. You saw that earlier. Let's follow one. So we add this three carbon compound into the system. Immediately, we pull off some electrons to make one NADH. And we also cleave one of the carbons to produce this carbon dioxide molecule, leaving us with a two carbon compound, which incorporates or adds to the end result of the previous cycle, a four carbon compound, to make a six carbon compound, right? So here's four carbons, these pink C's. Here's two, four plus two is six. This is citrate or citric acid. This is sometimes called the citric acid cycle. Same thing as citrate, citric acid, named after Hans Krebs. That's where the name Krebs comes from. He was a, oh, I always forget what nationality he was. Hans, maybe he was from Austria, I don't know. He won a Nobel Prize for it. And then this six carbon citric acid or citrate undergoes what, eight different reactions? Eventually, we make our way back to a four carbon compound, which can combine with more two carbon compounds from other pyruvic acids, and we just keep on cranking through, right? Well, what do we make per crank through the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle? If we start with a six and we end with a four carbon, what does that leave us with? Having to deal with what? Start with six carbons, end with four carbons. Where's the other two carbons at? You see them? Carbon dioxide. Right. There's one here and there's one there. There's the two carbons. We also lost one up here at the top, didn't we? In what I call the bridging reaction, which bridges glycolysis with citric acid. We also make three NADHs. Wait, how one. Sorry, right. carbon dioxide do you make? Two. You see my arrows? Any other questions about that? So we, we make a couple of CO2s. We make three NADHs. We make one FADH2, and we make one ATP. So for every revolution through the Krebs cycle, you should be able to tell me, and we'll include the bridging reaction here, how many NADHs, ATPs, CO2s, FADH2s 
are made. If I were to ask you how many FADH2 molecules made in Krebs cycle per original glucose, what would your answer be? Would it be two? It would be two, right. So one more question about the carbon dioxides. Do you not count the one that, um, that one that you're pointing to, you don't count that one? Well, it's technically not made in the Krebs cycle. It's made in this intermediary bridging reaction. I call it the bridging reaction. You've heard me use that term, right? That's the term I came up with. Your, your book doesn't have a name for this uh, reaction. They use a term like linking or something like that. But, you know, for our simplicity sake, if we want to just include the third CO2 up here, we, we can. It's not technically made here, though, right? It, it, it's made just before the Krebs cycle begins. So how many CO2s made per original glucose? in aerobic respiration, what would your answer be? Six. Right, six. Because you got to go through this two times. Because you got two pyruvic acids made per one glucose. So are we good with this? Um, what specifically do you want to know about or review with regard to electron transport? Or are you good with electron transport? This is, this is probably one of the harder topics to, to understand. And I think we, we, we talked a bit about this already. We can talk about it again. I don't know. That's fine. Could you just quickly go through that again? Sure. Thank you. So what's happening now is we're taking all these NADH and FADH2 molecules we've been accumulating that we got from glycolysis and citric acid cycle. And they dump off their electrons and they become oxidized into NAD and FAD. It's actually NAD plus technically, but we'll leave it NAD. Where do these go? Do they just like uh, disintegrate or what? Back to go pick up more electrons. Right, they're reused, exactly. We said they were like the empty buses. We picked up more electron passengers. These are full of electrons. And out go the passengers, the electrons. They, they spill out of the bus. Empty bus goes back, picks up more electrons, brings them to electron transport, aptly named, right? Electron transport. And here the electrons are transported to specific embedded proteins, as you see listed here. And as those electrons get passed from protein to protein to protein, that sets up the movement of hydrogen ions into this intermembrane space. Now, of course, here we're talking about mitochondrion as it would exist in a eukaryotic cell. We'll talk about where this happens in bacteria in just a minute, but just use this as a preliminary example. If you can understand this, you can transition to bacteria, no problem. And so these hydrogen ions develop or uh, accumulate, I should say, in this intermembrane space. You can see them all out here. They didn't get there, couldn't have gotten there without electron transport. I can't speak to the mechanism or the nitty gritty of, of the chemistry of how that powers the, the, the traveling of these hydrogen ions from the matrix into the intermembrane space. All I can tell you is that the electron transport mechanism is the vehicle, the mechanism, the source, the power, if you will, of how those ions get pushed out here. But they wouldn't get pushed out here unless the electrons did their 
their movement from protein to protein to protein embedded in this inner membrane. Now, ultimately, where do those electrons go? If this is aerobic respiration, by definition, the final electron acceptor is oxygen. There it is, right here. So oxygen combines with the electrons and some protons to make good old H2O. So our cells right now are making H2O for us. We might be getting it from the food we're drinking, but we also make it. So now what happens to all these hydrogen ions? Well, they would love to diffuse back into the matrix, wouldn't they? Sure they would. Can they do that? The answer is yes. Only if they pass through this special protein called ATP synthase. And so as they diffuse back across the inner mitochondrial membrane into the matrix where they were earlier, that is causing the phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. This is called oxidative phosphorylation. And that's how aerobes generate the majority of their ATP via oxidative phosphorylation versus substrate level. Substrate level produces some ATP as we saw back in glycolysis uh, and even one in the citric acid cycle. But, but the cell is going to generate aerobically many, many times that number via this oxidative phosphorylation process. So this slide talks about what we just described. There's a video that talks Good about time. the movement of the hydrogen ions. Here we're now getting into where does this occur in the prokaryotic cell? Well, as it says here, the cytoplasm is where the first two pathways occur. But because there's no mitochondria, the electron transport mechanism occurs between the cell membrane and the periplasmic space, as opposed to the inner mitochondrial membrane uh, and the intermembrane space. But you can see ATP synthase, that's the same enzyme. Here's those various proteins that the electrons passed from one to the next, and that powered the movement of the ions, right? Same old, same old. This is just in a bacterial cell. Um, and again, this talks about the final electron acceptor being oxygen. Um, this goes into the yield of ATP per glucose, and it's really somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 ATPs per glucose because we don't get a, an exact 3 to 1 ratio of ATP per NADH and 2 to 1 per FADH2. It's a little less than that, and there's some other subtracting we need to do because of active transport. So we get down to close to 30 ATPs per glucose, still very significant. Compare that to fermentation, we're only generating two. So it's 15 times more efficient aerobically. Um, this gets into a little bit of, of anaerobic respiration, which again involves the three pathways. Um, the major difference is that at the end, instead of oxygen being the final electron acceptor, it's some other compounds like nitrate, um, sulfate, that's what this SO4 minus 2 is. They're just other, other ions. These are all ions because they're negatively charged. Um, and then again, we talk about uh, lactic acid and um, alcohol fermentation. These are two examples. There are many others as well, but these are the two that the book kind of describes. You've heard of, I think, these, at least lactic acid fermentation in a &P. you should have, in the muscular system. We talk about that a little bit, how it can get generated via very strenuous activity, and uh, eventually it can accumulate in the muscle, causing oxygen debt, it's called, and, you know, physically you come up with cramps, and you might mentally want to go on and get to that finish line, but your body says, not going to happen. 
it's really interesting. You know, mentally you might want to do it, but the body says, I, I don't have any more oxygen to get to the tissues. I've built up so much lactic acid. I've gone anaerobic. I'm only, I'm only cranking out, you know, one fifteenth as much ATP as I wish I could. Brain says, yes, crank out 15 times, but body says, not going to happen. You hit a brick wall, sort of, you know. Um, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's exercise physiology. It gets into a lot of topics that you, you learn about if you took a higher level physiology courses and such. This is all chemistry, isn't it? You know, you guys hate chemistry, but you can't talk about a lot of these things unless you have some fundamental knowledge of chemistry. You don't have to be a chemist, but you have to understand a little bit about chemistry. Um, yeah, okay. This is talking about the synthesis of organic compounds, not the catabolism, but how some pathways can actually make, manufacture organic compounds. Uh, amphibolic, which is a term I think is, which is introduced here somewhere. Yeah, right here. Means that some of these pathways can be bidirectional, depending upon the needs of the cell at any given time. If you need to break the glucose down to make energy, then do it. But sometimes if you don't need to do that, maybe you can take and you can make amino acids from that excess glucose or some of the intermediate byproducts of the glyco uh, glycosidic pathway. So that's what these, these arrows are going back up into organic molecules. So it's, it's kind of interesting getting back to metabolism and chemistry and such. And then we said, don't worry about photosynthesis. That was the very end, I think, of, of chapter eight. Don't worry about that. Um, and then we spent quite a bit of time on chapter nine, which was the microbial genetics chapter. Uh, and again, because we just are getting down to the last few minutes, um, are there specific aspects of nine you want to look at? Hopefully you've been following the PowerPoints and the Zoom lectures and so on and so forth. I'm just pulling this up now. Any specific topics within this chapter? That are really confusing to you? Are you good with Transcription, translation, DNA replication, um, and then we get into conjugation. We talk about transformation. We talk about transduction. Anything on, on that? Um, chapter nine was genetic engineering. And this was that, that was the video that I, I snipped from last spring and inserted into um, our course shell. We um, only had about, what, 24 slides, I think, on this chapter. We bounce around quite a bit in this chapter. It gets very, very technical, um, I think, and really beyond the scope of what we need to get into in terms of details. I want you to have some basic understanding of what's going on when we take desired genes and we can ins insert them into bacteria or sometimes using a virus, we can insert them into our own genome to help um, cure diseases. 
I mean, there's some some amazing benefits. And it's not without its controversy, of course, too. You know, genetically modified organisms, is it safe to, to be growing, um, you know, 80% of our corn in the United States or soybeans that have been genetically modified? Will that have any long-term impact on, on the ecology of our world? Um, I don't know if the, you know, the jury's still out on a lot of that, but there's no question. There's a lot of benefits we can we can in, we can um, we can inc incorporate disease resistance into our our crops rather than spraying them with insecticides. We can put the insecticide gene into the plant, and the plant can generate the anti-worming chemical or the antifungal chemical all in the plant. The plant produces it because we insert the desired gene into the plant, or we insert the desired gene into the salmon. And it can grow to be a really big fish really, really quickly in, in farms that we can we can grow them and then we can sell them at Reeds or Wigman's or Tops or wherever because there's a real demand for salmon. Because fresh caught Alaska salmon is very expensive, but we can we can grow pigs faster, we can make milk faster, more efficiently, we can do all sorts of things. Again, not without potential debate. A lot of people are concerned about that. Should we be doing that just because we can? Should we be doing that? But I think by now in your life, you should all realize that there's one thing that really governs the world we live in, and that's called this, the almighty dollar, <laughs> right? It ultimately boils down to money, good or bad, right or wrong. How can we make some, something as cheaply as we can so that we can sell more of it? It's not necessarily a good attitude to have, but it is, it is our world. It is our, the way we function, a lot of us, I guess. Again, I'm not trying to say that genetic engineering is all out to make money. That's not what I'm saying. But there's a lot of positives, a lot of good things being done, but we need to be conscious of what is also being done that could have less than desirable impacts down the road, maybe. Um, so we, I think, said that we were not going to include the genetic engineering in the second exam, right? Yeah, you just said I was going to meet through chapter yeah. six, seven, eight, and nine. Yeah. yeah. So, so you've got some time to kind of uh, look at 10. Maybe you haven't even gotten into 10 yet, some of you. So, I don't know where you are in your studying, but it's not something you need to worry about for the test on Thursday. Um, So I'm going to be, you know, starting some of you guys a little bit later than the typical 1.15 to 2.30 time slot. And I think I know who you are, you know, Jocelyn and Stephanie. And I'm not sure who's all here, Jenna and Jocelyn and um, Sarah. I think those are most of you guys. And Melissa, we, we talked about. About you already. So I'll have that open Thursday, 115 to 230. Um, format will be similar to what we've had, you know, before. I think I told you all this. Any any questions? All right. Well, I hope you have a great Easter. Get outside today. Enjoy the weather if you can. I'm stuck till 5.30 in lab, unfortunately. Okay, see you later. Bye.